guys. Okay. Um, I'm actually, I'm not a professional beekeeper by any means. Um, uh, I earn my living as a management consultant and my PhD is in organizational psychology. So as you can see, it has absolutely nothing to do with beekeeping. But I became a beekeeper in the year 2000. It was very much my millennial project. Uh, and I'd always had a fascinated in the environment generally. Over the years, I've been involved in husbandry of various sorts of animals and creatures, uh, including fish and reptiles. So this was a new venture for me. And I was trained very much in the conventional beekeeping, uh, which has remained unchanged since the 1850s. Um, <clears throat> but around about uh, 2006, uh, my bees had then expanded from one colony to 20 colonies uh, and it was getting a bit of a full-time job and I started looking at perhaps ways of handling this with a lot less work. At the same time um, it became fairly clear to me and a lot of my neighbours because I live out in the country with a lot of farmers was that um, they were concerned that the amount of pollinators was declining rapidly. Uh, <clears throat> some of their crops particularly the ones who were growing edible crops as we see in the picture here, uh, we're finding their crops were not getting pollinated. So I started looking into this whole area of uh, pollination and who does it and why. And the first thing one found is that there are over 1,500 different pollinating insects in the UK. Um, all sorts, bugs, beetles, bees, butterflies, moths, and the populations of all of them have been declining steadily for the last 40 years. It's feared that some of these pollinated insects have actually become extinct. And this is mainly due to a destruction of habitat uh, through a variety uh, of reasons. Um, we see a lot more um, amenity land, which uh, for some reason, local authorities will insist on closely mowing, so nothing ever grows there. We see considerable amounts of changing farming practices. Uh, you only have to go into the East Coast to see the monoculture there, oilseed rape, um, and equally the destruction of the hedgerows to make larger fields so they can get bigger machines on it. And the increasing use of pesticides. Um, and we tend to say these are all due to commercial usage, but in fact, if you go into any garden center, there is, I guarantee, a row of shelves dedicated to pesticides of various sorts. And it is estimated that private people in their gardens use more pesticides combined uh, than the whole of the farmers. Uh, that's not something to be proud of. It's um, quite a, a big problem. The other thing is that the modern pesticides are so efficient they're staying in the ground for much longer. And a lot of them are systemic, which means they actually grow with the plant uh, and pass on to anything that eats that plant uh, later on. And then we get, and we've seen this in beekeeping, the introduction of diseases uh, and non-native species. Uh, beekeepers uh, found that in 1992, we had a pest called Varroa, which since has done a tremendous amount of damage in all bee populations. Uh, and that was introduced and in crops coming in from uh, the Far East. There have been lots of other diseases and pests come in through importation, uh, and that's been quite a serious problem. So according to DEFRA, 60% of all the food crops we grow are dependent on insect pollination. And as you can see, it's a whole variety of top fruits, soft fruits, and even a wide range of vegetables. Not to mention, of course, things like brambles, uh, which are wild growing the hedgerows, but form a very important component of the food stuff for the winter for birds and small mammals. So altogether, it's uh, quite a, a contribution they make. Ensuring that there are sufficient pollinators around is actually an effective to achieve effective pollination is a really essential aspect of permaculture, which is often ignored. Uh, when I speak to allotment holders collectively, they often are totally unaware that um, they need these creatures 
to fertilize their crops. And yet all the pollinators without exception are wild creatures that cannot be domesticated. So they rely on wild populations uh, of everything. There's only one exception of all the 1500 plus insects that pollinate, there's only one exception um, to that, and that's honeybees. And they're the only creature that can be managed in quantities sufficiently large to achieve effective pollination in heavily planted areas. Uh, if you have a field of field beans or peas, uh, it is very unlikely that the po native population of pollinators across the board would pollinate that not only in total, but in the effective time that you need it to. Your field will come into flower and perhaps be available for pollination for about three weeks. You need that pollinated in that period of time. But the reason why honeybees can be managed in sufficient quantities is the way they live. All the other pollinators live singly or in very small colonies, whereas a colony of honeybees can be up to about 60,000 bees uh, at the height of the season. However, when it comes to managing honeybees and talk to any beekeeper, there's an old saying in beekeeper, beekeeping, ask two beekeepers and you'll get three different answers. Um, and this is quite a problem. The conventional beekeepers, uh, which you see here uh, on the right of this spectrum, are very much into an intensive form of beekeeping. Um, in America, if you go there, the commercial bee farmers actually have it mechanized. They handle thousands of hives at a time uh, using machines. But in this country, uh, the hobbyist beekeeper, the conventional beekeepers, are constantly in, going into their bees, at least weekly, um, their main aim is to produce honey, of course, but they're quite happy to manipulate the bees uh, and use a whole range of medication. Since the turn of the, uh, the millennium, uh, there's been a new breed of beekeeper around called the natural beekeepers. Um, and they believe basically in no, not intervening at all. So their approach is a bit like putting a bird box up in the garden. Uh, they'll put a hive out if the bees live in it. Uh, that's fine, but they don't do anything. So I was very much looking for a middle path, and many other people uh, think the same way as I do, where we actually manage our bees effectively, but with minimal interventions. Uh, and we call that alternative beekeeping. And I would suggest that this approach is the only practical approach for somebody who wants to grow crops, who's made interested in growing crops, and bees are there just to help. But we'll talk a little more about that and you can see where it comes from. Just to give you an overview to contrast the two approaches, with conventional beekeepers, they inspect each colony every week during the swarming season. And this is largely to prevent their bees from swarming. Uh, they'll happily rearrange the frames uh, in the hive. Um, frequent use of chemicals to treat for pests and diseases. And they'll try to prevent the natural process of swarming. I'll talk more about swarming in, shortly. And they'll extract honey irregularly and then go on to artificially feed their bees. The alternative approach is we only inspect our bees three or four times a year, in the spring, in the midsummer, and in the autumn, unless there's a specific reason for doing something else. We'd rarely rearrange the frames in a hive. Uh, the bees, it's the bees' house, they know how to, to live, they know what they're doing as far as I'm concerned. We certainly do not treat with chemicals. Um, most bee treatments suggest that the beekeeper dresses up in some protective clothing before they're used. And then they tell us that these chemicals, which are very harmful to man, uh, will kill all the unwanted pests, but miraculously leave the bees uh, alone. Um, the science doesn't actually support that. But we will allow our bees to swarm naturally. Swarming is a process by which the, bee, the colony of bees reproduces itself. When you're thinking of bees, it's not the same as having two or three dogs or two or three cats. 
a colony of bees is one superorganism and it acts as one superorganism, albeit with lots of different parts. So the individual bees are a bit like cells in the human body. They die and are replaced. But allowing the bees to swarm naturally um, allows them to satisfy a natural urge uh, to reproduce rather than the preventative techniques that the conventional beekeepers use. Now we only extract surplus honey when it is a genuine surplus. Now the bees will collect nectar and convert it into honey if there's nectar to collect. And they can build up substantial surpluses. Their purpose in doing that is to have enough food to seed them through the winter. But traditionally, honey is extracted in the autumn. And then the bees, in order to keep them alive, are fed um, on sugar solutions, which research shows isn't particularly good for them either. So we rarely artificially feed. If the colony isn't strong enough to feed itself, which is what you'd have to do in the wild, then perhaps it's too weak to bother keeping. So you want to keep some bees with a minimum effort. Well, it's important to realize straight away that in order to survive, your bees are going to need supplies of nectar, pollen, and water. Now, nectar and pollen they get from wildflowers, although they do in fact in most areas get more of these things from trees, mature trees. And a, a large tree, such as a large horse chestnut, probably gives up more pollen and nectar than half an acre of wildflowers, which is why it's sometimes called an acre in the sky. But if you're going to keep bees, it's essential to ensure that you have sufficient quantities of these things through from March to October. Now, out in the wild, this probably isn't a problem, but if you're growing crops where well, you might have an abundance of these for a period of time, you've got to remember that you need to feed them for these six months. The other thing to remember is that honeybees only forage for up to about three miles. So if your um, field of field beans is three or four miles away from a colony of bees, then it may not get very well pollinated. So if you have more than one site, more than three miles apart, you might need to consider moving your bees from site to site. Uh, <clears throat> this is called migratory beekeeping, um, where people will site their hives in one field because it's got stuff to pollinate, and three or four weeks later, when the pollination is finished, they'll move it on to the next site. Uh, in America, of course, North America, that's taken to an enormous extent where most of the commercially kept bees are kept on the back of flatbed trucks. And they spend uh, the spring, January, February, in California, uh, pollinating almonds. They then move northwards to pollinate a whole variety of field crops, peas and beans, before ending up in Northwest states like Oregon, uh, <clears throat> Washington state, where they'll pollinate top fruit like apples. They then come down the East Coast, pollinating citrus fruits and get dumped in the Arizona desert to overwinter. So these poor bees are never in one place for more than about uh, four, <coughs> four or five weeks. That doesn't happen in the UK. But why I bring that point up is, if you're going to move your bees around regularly, that will have an impact on your choice of beehive, what type of beehive you actually use. They basically come into two types, long hives and vertical hives. And that's a long hive. It offers a one box solution. Um, everything you want is in one box. It also avoids the need for frequent heavy lifting. You can build in high levels of insulation into a long hive because you're not going to move it. Uh, and insulation is in fact a great benefit to the bees. If you can imagine most wild bees live in hollow trees where they're surrounded by four, five, six inches of wood insulation around the sides, several feet of insulation on the top and the bottom, which not only helps to keep them warm, but it avoids the quick fluctuations of temperature 
which is something which does a great deal of damage to the bees. However, once they're set up, they're very heavy and not easily moved. Uh, a hive like this one on the left, um, we have quite a few of them. Full of bees, it takes two to three people to lift it and move it. The conventional beehives are stacks of smaller boxes. And one of the disadvantages is, in order to get inside to manipulate them, you are constantly uh, lifting the boxes up and down. And these boxes, even though they are small, particularly compared to the head of the long hives, uh, can weigh anywhere up to 50, 60 pounds. So unless you're very fit or very strong, uh, <clears throat> that's quite a task. They're also constructed from very thin wood, which doesn't provide much in the way of insulation. Uh, typically, the timber used is about half an inch thick. Um, however, they have a much smaller footprint and can be readily moved. And in fact, if you need to move your bees around frequently, this is probably the type of hive you should go for. Having got some hives, you'll need a site for your apiary. Apiary is just a fancy name for a collection of hives put together. Now, there are a number of things to consider when creating an apiary. Um, and if you don't think about them beforehand, you can come unstuck in a big way. If you're in a built up area, like um, allotments often are, it's important to avoid creating a nuisance for your neighbours. And equally, it's important not to place too many hives on one site, because if the bees are having to compete with one another uh, for foodstuffs, uh, they often turn aggressive. Uh, and attack anybody that moves on site, which will make you really popular with everybody else. Bees aren't too bothered by cold, but they do not like damp. So in the past, not so much in this part of the world, but in the south, we've seen a lot of apiaries flooded, uh, particularly as the weather seems to be uh, quite unpredictable at the moment. And again, this is important. For some reason, stock, particularly sheep, uh, horses, and donkeys, not to mention deer, seem to really enjoy rubbing themselves up against the beehive. Unfortunately, with the vertical hives, this normally knocks them over, which upsets the bees who sting the animal. So if you've got hives in a field, uh, it is highly advisable to ensure that you have a stockproof fence around them um, which gives a space of about two to three meters. Unfortunately, unless you're going to look like a prison camp, you can't um, put a fence around them that keeps the deer out, but then the deer are normally aren't big enough to push the hives over, but the deer, again, seem to really love rubbing up against the hive. Now, it's very tempting to stick your, your hives in a corner of the field away from everything, but bear in mind, you will have to get to them from time to time. So access by vehicle or barrow, preferably vehicle, uh, is really a very valuable commodity. I've got one apiary where I have to walk a good quarter of a mile to get to the hives, and it really is a pain to have to do that. It's not particularly a problem in this part of the world, but it does help if you, your hives can't easily be seen from public footpaths. Youths are known to take a delight in throwing stones at hives for some reason. Um, so if they, if they don't know where they are, that's just an added protection. Again, mark your equipment that have been hive thefts. And if possible, leave some contact details in a prominent place in case anything happens to them, they get blown over, then somebody can contact you. I know that sounds very onerous, and it's, uh, but it's really a lot of common sense um, and something you ought to think about before you set your hive up or when, when you choose a site for your apiary.
Again, the thing to think about is when you're citing beehives, allow some space to work around them. Now, I always say a minimum of one meter all the way around, although a bit more if you can manage it. And then ensure that your hives are not standing directly on the ground. They're just raised a bit above it. This helps keep the damp out uh, and helps keep smaller vermin out. Of course, if you're moving your hives around, uh, you can stick them almost anywhere for a period of time. Um, I believe it or not, the sunflowers contribute very little to bees. They're mainly wind pollinated, but lavender certainly is a bee's favorite. Uh, and you see it quite frequently in the eastern counties, Norfolk in particular. So let's think a bit about the bees. Almost all the honeybees in the UK are hybrids uh, of three different subspecies. And this is because until 1920-ish, there was only one species of bee in the UK. But then the country suffered um, almost like a COVID ex, um, <clears throat> epidemic amongst bees. It was a thing called Isle of White disease because that's where it started. And it decimated the native honeybee stocks. So the government and the farmers at the time then started um, importing bees from the continent. And the result was a series of hybrids. So a native bee, the black bee, uh, is what we see here. It's the one we're trying very hard to bring back into this part of the UK in particular, because it tolerates the colds better than the other three, and it tolerates damp weather and overwinters better. But perhaps the most popular bee uh, that's been imported is the Coniolan. It mainly comes from countries like Slovakia, Slovenia, Hungary, Central Europe. Um, and it's a, a nice bee to work with. Um, it's not quite as hardy in this country as it could be, but um, they're imported in vast quantities and still, well, and used to be. And the other bee is the Italian bee. Now, the Italian bee is a very pretty bee, bright yellow color, uh, very hardworking. It does not overwinter well in this country. One of the reasons though, it was imported in large numbers was because uh, the beekeeping season in Sicily, where they're largely bred, uh, starts back end of January, early February, whereas in our part of the world, it's back end of May, early June. So farmers could, and people could import these bees very early in the season. However, uh, since Brexit came on, um it's illegal now to import bees into the uk other than queen bees this has been welcomed by beekeepers and complained about by bee farmers um there is however a loophole and that is bees can be imported from europe into northern ireland and then they are classed as Northern Irish bees, so they can then be imported into the UK. It's a loophole both the Irish and the UK are trying to plug, um, whether they're successful or not, we'll wait and see. But what we're suggesting is if you do decide to get bees, is always go for a local strain of bees rather than import from outside. Now we talk about a colony of bees as a superorganism. There are actually three types of bee inside the hive. We've got the drone, and we've got the queen, and we've got the worker. Now the slide on the left, you see a queen bee in the center. The queen bee, and there's only one queen bee in a colony, has largely one task, and that is to lay eggs. And she can lay round about 2,000 eggs a day in the season. She's also got the ability to lay a fertilized egg or an unfertilized egg. Fertilized eggs hatch into female bees, which are the worker bees, and the unfertilized eggs hatch into drones or male bees. 
The picture on the left is actually taken from the picture on the right. So if you've got really keen eyes, you might be able to pick out where the section is taken from. No doubt everybody later will tell me, yes, I spotted it. If you haven't, it's up in the top right hand corner. But if we actually look into the cell, these are the eggs. They're tiny things, barely visible to the human eye, uh, and they hatch into larvae after about three days. Most people, particularly as they get older, find eggs are almost impossible to spot, but science has come to our aid. For some reason, I don't quite understand why, but if you use an LED torch and shine it on them, the eggs do reflect the light back. So you can see pinpoints of light, uh, which are eggs, uh, which is just as well, otherwise I would never know because my eyesight's not brilliant. But after three days, the eggs hatch into larvae. You can you just see them curled up in the bottom there. Um, and they're fed a mixture of uh, pollen and nectar, which we call bee bread. Uh, and on day 10, they're all sealed over with a wax cap like that. And then on day 21, 22, out they hatch uh, as new bees. Now, every now and again, in the spring, in the swarming season, the colony will decide it needs to reproduce itself. So it'll produce a different sort of cell. It's about the size of a peanut. There'll be one egg in there, and that will be fed on a very different sort of diet called royal jelly. And eventually that will hatch into a new queen. And just as the first of these new queens hatches, the old queen and about half the colony, uh, it's about 20 to 30,000 bees, will take to the air and fly away to look for a new site. They don't seem to have a new site in mind when they go off and they settle anywhere. And um, these are just some of the places where um, we photographed swarms of bees. Queen bee will be right in the center of that swarm somewhere. The bees will stay there for anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of days, and then they'll move off to a new site, which some scout bees have been looking out for them. Here you see in the center, the swarm has found itself a new hollow tree. On the right, it's found a box which we put there purposely for it to find. So that's a new Desires, which we call a swarm box. Um, and that tices the bees to go into it. And on the left, you see another one just before the swarming season. <coughs> um, and after a while, the bees will settle in there and we simply move them out to a new hive when we want to. But if you're going to have bees with your permaculture, well, some swarms, as you can see here, are very easy to catch. You just put a box underneath it, shake the branch, and they very conveniently drop in. As long as you get the queen bee, which you nearly always do because she's right in the center, you've caught the swarm. But sometimes they're more difficult. Uh, I remember feeling decidedly nervous at the top of that tree, uh, juggling the box with one hand, holding onto the tree with another, hoping my knee rack around the ladder would hold the lot together, because uh, that was some 30 feet up. Doesn't often happen, but they sometimes do go uh, quite high. But whatever type of beekeeper you're going to be, you must have a strategy for either preventing or managing your swarms. Um, one of the problems beekeepers are having in central London at the moment because it's become very fashionable and middle class to keep your bees on a flat roof. Um, but the bees don't always find another home quite readily. 
and they do tend to swarm all over the place. Now the conventional beekeepers will try very much to prevent swarms by inspecting their bees each week from around mid-March to mid-July and then taking preventative action. The problem with that is if you actually miss an inspection, or let's say as I used to, I inspected my bees every Saturday morning and come Saturday morning it was absolutely pouring down and I couldn't and it was pouring down on Tuesday I was back to work on sorry on Sunday I was back to work on Monday I'd missed it which meant the bees almost certainly would swarm. The alternative approach is to manage your swarming and here we have what we call swarm boxes but basically they're semi-permanent houses that the bees can decide to swarm into these are at our, our club apiary um, again we don't have to inspect these every week we inspect them just when we're up there for whatever reason if the bees have swarmed they'll have gone into one of these boxes uh, and if they're not in the boxes then they haven't swarmed um, it's a much easier month a way to manage your bees it's less time consuming and it does mean that you can move the bees into a more suitable permanent home as and when you feel it's up to you. Meanwhile, back in the old hive, as you saw there was several queen cells there. The first queen to hatch has her first duty is to bump off all the others, to go around and kill all the other queen cells. Queen bees are not called queen bees for anything. There is only one they do not like and will not tolerate another one as a rule. So her first task is then to go out, uh, is to go and kill off the others. Her second task is to get mated. And she does this by going off onto what we call a mating flight. Uh, all the drones, the male bees will have congregated in certain areas. We don't know why, but they do. The virgin queens find them. Again, we don't know how. She will mate with anywhere up to a dozen and perhaps make anywhere up to a dozen um, mating flights. She stores the sperm and uses it as she wants to uh, subsequently. If she runs out of sperm, of course, the bees will boot her out and get another queen. But the important thing from a beekeeping point of view is if your new queen doesn't mate in the first three weeks due to bad weather, she can't mate at all. She, she passes the period and your colony may well die. It all sounds a lot to take in. It, it isn't quite that complicated. So you finally come to the point where you decide you want some bees, so how do you get hold of them? Well, there are only four ways. You can either buy a colony of bees, what we call a nucleus, which is essentially a mini colony you can buy a package now a package is li literally one and a half kilos of bees by weight with a queen which may or may not have come from that colony uh, or a swarm now since the 1st of january 2021 this year it's been illegal to import bees and Normally, there's somewhere of the region of 25,000 nuclei and packages imported each year, again, mainly from Italy. That is now illegal. So we are anticipating there's going to be a shortage of bees for a few years until clubs such as ourselves get around to breeding bees uh, in larger quantities. You, back, packages in British bees have never been particularly popular, but they are available. The most common way of getting bees is either a swarm or a nucleus. So, what else do you need? Well, you need some protective clothing. And one of the popular ways is a thing we call a bee suit. Now, until about 19... Until about the year 2000, this was the traditional bee suit, but normally in white. Um, and why it was traditional was it had this broad brimmed hat with a veil all the way around. 
Then with the turn of the millennium, the so-called fencer suit came on with this type of full fencing mask. Um, strangely enough, after about 20 years, most people are reverting back to the brimmed hat. But you will need one. Um, they cost anywhere from about £25 to £500. £25 ones are mainly made in the Middle East, in Pakistan. Um, they're thick, they're heavy, they're protective. They are very, very hot in the summer. They take a lot of washing and an even more drying, whereas the one on the right is much more lightweight material, not quite as protective, but probably a better bet. The latest suits, all the way from Australia, believe it or not, are literally air conditioned. Uh, they have an air conditioning type of fabric, which keeps you cool, despite the fact it might be hot outside. I expect to pay about 500 pounds for them. The other thing to bear in mind is these suits are coming from Pakistan. The Pakistanis seem to have a very strange idea of the British anatomy. One gets the impression that in Pakistan, everybody is tall and slim. Where in Britain, where people are slightly more rotund, uh, you might have one that's sufficiently tall for you. It may not be sufficiently broad in the girth, so it's worth checking. Other pieces of kit are a thing called a smoker, which conventional beekeepers use. Smoke can be used to drive bees away if you particularly want them to get them out of the way. It does tend to make them aggressive. But a central piece of kit is a thing called a hive tool, which has all sorts of uses, clearing propolis, clearing uh, wax out of the way, hooking frames out. They're absolutely essential. They cost about £10 in stainless steel. Um, and it's worthwhile having one that's painted a bright colour, red, yellow, orange, whatever, on the other side. Why? You'd be amazed how often you drop them in the grass and can't find them if they're just stainless steel whereas the colour does enable you to find them a lot more easily. And then we come to gloves. Now you see in the picture on the right, the gentleman is holding a pair of uh, kid leather gloves, which is the ones that the uh, bee companies tend to want to sell you. They do give you total protection against things on your hands. They do make your hands very insensitive and clumsy, and the bees seem to love to sting them. Most of us use disposable nitrile gloves. Um, they're disposable so we don't spread disease from one colony to the other. Uh, they stop your hands getting sticky. You do get stung through them, but that's just part of the joys of beekeeping. Now, what's one about this? Most people know two things about honeybees. They produce honey and they sting. Uh, yes, they do. And you see on the left, a sting uh, in a human skin. Human skin's peculiar, apparently. Uh, bees can quite happily sting cats and dogs and most of their animals um, with impunity. Whereas if they sting human beings, they sting their sting, the end of it, gets stuck in our skin. And when they pull it out, it rips open their stomach, as you can see on the right, and the bee will die. Which is unfortunate, but one of those things. We do encourage in our club people to get stung on our bee creeping courses. And the reason for that is some people get a bad reaction to a bee sting. It causes anaphylactic shock. For most people, a bee sting produces a temporary pain, it's a prick, and they become itchy after about 24 hours, and that's about it. For others, the stings can cause an allergic reaction, which can range anywhere from mild to severe. And when I say severe in extremely rare cases, it's life-threatening which is why, uh, again, we, when we're training beekeepers, like to see them get stung so we can treat, we know, we know what to look for, we can treat people and identify them. If you are one of the unfortunate people that suffers from a severe reaction, I would suggest that beekeeping perhaps 
uh, it's not the uh, hobby for you. Uh, so then you can either set the kids on doing or the, or the spouse, uh, but it's not worth the risk. Anaphylactic shock can come in very quickly. Now this might be an aspect you didn't think about, but let's have a look at the law and beekeeping because it does affect us all. Believe it or not, honeybees have been causing lawyers a problem for at least 4,000 years. Uh, the ancient Egyptians had all sorts of laws regarding bees. Uh, the Romans certainly did, the Greeks did, and it's gone down through European medieval history. I won't go into vast details, but let's look at a few of the important points. There's a fundamental principle that every landowner can have reasonable use of his land, and the courts have decided that beekeeping is a reasonable use of land. But, and it's always a but, you can't do that if by doing so you unreasonably restrict neighbours' enjoyment. Now, what is reasonable and unreasonable is, of course, a topic that lawyers love to get involved in. And there haven't been many cases, but the few that they have show that it's very difficult to draw any particular conclusion. The judges decide each one on their merit. But there is a second piece of legislation which uh, could have an impact. It hasn't on beekeepers so far. Um, but that is causing a nuisance. Now, <clears throat> as I said, beekeepers haven't suffered particularly from this piece of legislation yet. But when you uh, see the sorts of things that uh, judgments have been made on, particularly by magistrates' courts, uh, they did prohibit a 60-year-old lady from wandering around her own house uh, in a bikini because she could be seen by a primary school teacher, uh, children from the local school. Um, you begin to wonder what other nonsense the lawyers could come up with on that one. So in passing, it's a possibility. And again, if you're going to keep um, your bees near neighbours, in a garden, it's worthwhile talking to the neighbours first. Now there are several other areas of law that you need to be aware of and I'll cover them briefly. Your bees may swarm. Conventional beekeepers will say they use all sorts of techniques for preventing their bees from swarming and yet all of the conventional bee clubs have a swarm control officer to organize a collection of swarms that get away. If you keep bees sooner or later, your bees will swarm and get away. Now, if your bees swarm, you lose ownership of that swarm the minute it leaves the hive. And if the bees settle on someone else's land, the ownership of that swarm passes to that landowner if they can collect them and control them. So you have no legal right to enter someone else's land to collect a swarm. Now that is relatively modern law because in medieval times, as the beekeeper felt the bees were might swarm, they'd put a young child to sit by the hive and as the bees swarm, the child would run after them, and provided they what we call clanging, that is banging, normally a stick or a drum, to tell people they were coming, they could follow the swarm anywhere. There was no such thing as trespass if you were clanging. Uh, that does not apply anymore. But if the landowner gives you permission to enter the land and collect the swarm, ownership passes to you. Now, even if the bees originated from someone else's hive and landed on someone else's land and the land only gives you permission, they're your bees. Normally, landowners are very keen to give bees to the first beekeeper that will come along and take them away. So it's not a problem. 
diseases, there are certain notifiable diseases and pests, and you have a legal obligation if you are aware or suspect whether you are a beekeeper or not to inform the Secretary of State. I've never tried ringing up the Secretary of State and saying there's a bee disease in my garden. Uh, and in practice, most people will inform the local bee inspector. The notifiable diseases currently are the two types of fowl brood, um, which are endemic in various parts of the country, but fortunately not in Lancashire. And then we have three notifiable bee pests. Varroa destructor, as I said earlier, arrived in 1992 and is now endemic. But so far, the small hive beetle and the propylalaps might haven't been detected. One of the things that leaving the EU has done is that most of the imported bees, the 20, 30,000 colonies a year, came from Sicily. And small hive beetle, which comes from North America, is now endemic uh, in Sicily uh, and parts of southern Italy. So we may have saved ourselves. It might be a good brownie point for Brexit that um, we may be saved from that particular problem. But it's important as a beekeeper that you do learn to recognize these should it unfortunately happen in our area. <clears throat> and then we get the whole the veterinary medicines regulations. Now our conventional beekeepers are continually treating their bees with various forms of medication. And if these are not approved under this regulation, you can go to prison for a considerable period of time. You may recall about five or six years ago, the Queen's beekeeper in Balmoral, um, he didn't actually go to jail, but he got fined into the thousands of pounds for using illegal treatments on his bees. Uh, and you've got to keep quite extensive records of what you do. Um, and you've got to keep these records when you treated the bees, where you got the stuff from, how much you treated them for at least five years after uh, you treated them. And then we come to honey. It's illegal to sell honey unless it's in a jar with a label. And it's a legal to sell it unless that label complies with the various legislation. One at the top, you've got to put what it is. Uh, <clears throat> now I just put in this one Afton honey because I live in Afton and it's honey. And these are for my bees which are based in Afton. Some people try to get more specific and say it is um, heather honey or lavender honey or whatever. If you do that, you have got to be able to demonstrate that it is 96% pure from that particular uh, plant, which most of us can't do. We then have to have bottom left, a reference number. Uh, <clears throat> so this is batch number one of 21. You've got to say where it's come from. You can say product of England. You could say Lancashire. You've then got to say the weight in metric. Now, I'm not sure whether that is still legal. It certainly was the case up until 31st of December 2020. You can put the weight on in Imperial, but if you do, the size of the printer has got to be no larger than the metric. And then you've got to put a best before date on. Um, considering honey has been found in Egyptian pyramids, perfectly edible, at least 2000 years old, and never quite sure what to put for that date. I normally just put a couple of days, a couple of years on. Uh, most people never leave it that long before they eat it, uh, but it will last an interminable length of time. And then you've got to put on the producer's name and contact details. Uh, and then we come to poisoning. Fortunately, in our part of the world, where the principal crop is grass, um, the farmers don't tend to use much in the way of pesticides and insecticides. In other parts of the country where they do, 
um, these things can be um, <clears throat> systemic, that is, they're part and parcel, they pass through the plant into the pollen or nectar, and that eventually passes on to the honey. Uh, and concentrations of various things have been found in honey. So there is that possibility uh, there. Um, we do advise all beekeepers to take public liability cover. Um, that covers you for any activities you might have arising from your beekeeping activities. Some people say they already have it. Uh, you may well have, but I would suggest you check that it specifically refer, refers to beekeeping. And then you've got your product liability. If you use any of the hive products, and I'll mention them in a moment, you might want to consider product liability. And whilst equipment can be insured, bear in mind you're going to leave expensive hives and the like out in fields, uh, most insurers will not insure your stocks of bees. And then we have a bit of bureaucracy you need to be aware of. There is a thing called the National Bee Unit, which is part of DEFRA and has responsibility for the management and control of bee pests and allegedly training uh, beekeepers. There's a national database of beekeepers and apiaries. At the moment, registration is voluntary, but we do recommend it because if there is a problem, they will contact you and let you know. So if somebody gets foul brood in your part of the world, they'll come back and advise you. But then we have the thing called regional and seasonal bee inspectors, which are employed by the National Bee Unit. And the bee inspectors have the statutory right to enter your property, your land, and inspect your bees. In practice, they're very, very helpful. They normally contact you well before they want to come, invite you to be there when they do inspect your bees, and can offer often offer you some very valuable um, advice, but they do have a statutory right uh, to come into the land. So as well as pollinating your plants, uh, your bees provide a number of other things. This is honey. And in a good season, a typical long hive, as the ones I showed you earlier, would produce between 100 and 120 pounds worth of honey, um, which currently is selling for six to seven pounds a jar. So it uh, probably cost you about a pound a jar to produce. These are pollen grains, much loved by the health food uh, shops. It's a bit of a pain collecting it, but uh, it's another product if you want to do it. Then, of course, we have the wax. Bees produce a lot of wax, which can be turned into candles, uh, polishes, cosmetics of all sorts. Uh, and a lot of people use that. And in fact, the return on the wax is probably greater than the return on the honey. But the most valuable crop of all is the most difficult. It's what we call propolis. Bees collect a resin from trees and they make a sort of red gum from it. Um, which they stick everything up with they can. It does have quite well established medicinal pro uh, properties and it does sell at the moment for around about £60 um, an ounce. It's a pain to collect and you need an awful lot to make up an ounce, but there we are. That's a possibility if you want to go down that track. So bees make an important contribution to successful permaculture, whatever your aspirations, whether you're talking about allotments or commercial field crops. Um, it's, you need to ensure that there are bees nearby to make that happen. But again, this has just been an overview of what's involved in beekeeping. And I would strongly suggest you take an introductory course and get some insurance before you get any bees. We do as a club run an introductory course. This is an online course, which you can study in your own at time, which covers in much more detail all the things and more that I've been talking about this afternoon. And if you want any further information about that, just come onto our website. So thank you for listening. And are there any questions? <clears throat>
That's great, Fred. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you want to uh, unmute yourself to ask any questions, that's fine. Um, I just want to ask you about um, the long hive. Uh, you've recently decided that they needed some more insulation in the in the top. Uh, can you explain that, please? Yes. When we designed the long hive, we played around with various designs, um, and we recently had it checked out by Derek Mitchell, who's PhD, well, he's a lecturer, Dr. Derek Mitchell, who's an expert in this field. And he suggested we could probably do with some more insulation in the roof. Um, and the way we're achieving that is to put a sheet of 100 millimeter king span in the roof, cover it up with a sheet of plywood, uh, and that's that. So that just gives you uh, more insulation in the, in the roof space. It's not been a problem without the insulation, but it's just better with it. We're going for perfection. Yeah, and that helps them regulate the temperature in the brood chamber. Yes, the um, the, the point about insulation, it, it's twofold, is the bees maintain the environment within the hive by controlling the temperature, the humidity, and at least 14 different pheromones. Um, if they're constantly using up their energy to keep the hive warm because the heat's leaking out through the sides, the roof, the base, then they use up a lot of energy and they don't produce a lot of honey. Whereas if you can stop that leakage out, once they've got the hive warm, then they can use their energies for other things. The second point is, if you live on top of a hill like I do, the temperature can drop quite considerably uh, and quite rapidly. Uh, we notice during the summer, it might, or during the winter as well, the sun goes in and the temperature plummets. Um, that has a, a negative impact on the bees in that the cold hits them and they cluster where they are, often away from their food. Whereas if you've got a lot of insulation, it slows the whole process down and they have time to adjust to the drop in the temperature. Yeah, that's great. Um, I've just got another one as well. Uh, can you explain about the threat of the Asian hornet and have any been found this year at all in the UK? As far as I'm aware, uh, there's only been one uh, nest found this year in the UK. Um, the Asian hornet arrived in France about 10 years ago and is now pretty endemic in France. It's highly carnivorous and does target honeybee colonies. Uh, it's now endemic in the Channel Isles, which considering how close they are to France is not surprising. But there's enormous efforts going on to, um, uh, to try and stop it getting established in the UK. Last year, yeah, last year, most of the uh, hornets found had actually been brought back to the UK by people who had been camping on the continent and they'd had a hornet trapped in their nest, in their tent and hadn't noticed it. They're not a problem. The problem is if you get a fertile queen hornet um, and she sets up a nest, she can uh, <coughs> raise an awful lot of uh, new queens and each of those can form a colony to have a different sort of uh, life history to a honeybee. So it is important if we can to uh, eradicate them before they become established. There is a theory, and I'm not sure I believe it, that living where we do, we are too, we're too cold for them, but uh, we've been told that sort of thing before. It's certainly something we need to be very vigilant about because they can have a devastating effect. And we're certainly getting hotter, especially down south. That's true. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, just trying to think if I've got anything else. Does anybody, anyone else have a question? Uh, oh, yes, I just wanted to ask about the queen. Because the colony can't uh, survive without a queen, so if they lose one, like you said, if the queen doesn't get mated, then that's it. She, you know, she's of no use. Um, so is it like automatic instinct, will they then know that they need to start raising a queen again? Yes, uh, the queen gives off uh, a pheromone and the bees detect, they measure 
the strength of that pheromone. So as the queen becomes infertile, the amount of pheromone she produces drops off. Uh, <clears throat> if she doesn't get mated, she doesn't produce the right sort of pheromone. So the bees know if their queen is uh, doing her job properly. If they have eggs, fertile eggs, uh, fertilized eggs in the colony, they can convert any one of those into a potential queen. But bear in mind, they only have eggs for three days. That gives them a very narrow window. So if, for example, uh, as sometimes happen, a clumsy beekeeper squashes a queen while they're inspecting their hive, if there's eggs there, they can raise an emergency queen. That's not a problem. Uh, if the queen dies for any reason, suddenly they can do the same if they've got eggs. But if they've no eggs, the colony's dead. You can, if you recognize it in time, and it's not easy, uh, obtain a queen from somewhere else and introduce her into the hive, and that could save it. But whether you recognize that in time um, is anybody's guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. And just see if there's anything else. Uh, oh yeah, I just wanted to ask. Um, so now um, beekeeping's got very popular and they've run into problems in London, in the city. Mm -hmm. um, too many beehives and not enough um, crops for them to forage on. Yeah. So, so what, what's your view on that? How can we sort of go forward, but at the same time, we don't want to be causing more problems? Well, I think one you've got to look at that very much on an area by area basis. Um, it's a fact that more than half the country's beekeepers currently live within the M25, um, which is far, far too many. But in our part of the world at the moment, with the interest in uh, food futures, growing your own, um, that doesn't look like it's going to be a problem at all in that we're probably short of uh, pollinators in our part of the world. Uh, and I think you've got to look at each region on a regional basis, on even an area basis, before you make that decision. Yeah, see, uh, see where the where the forage is and how many beekeepers you've got and sort of maybe... Back maybe. to what I said right at the beginning. If you... Uh, let's take Lancaster City Council for sake of argument. Uh, they are talking about creating new areas of uh, allotment um, all over the place. Now, they're going to need pollinators within three miles of that allotment and they won't just happen rewilding is a great idea but it takes a lot of time and a lot of balance they want the pollinators in place as soon as the seeds are in place and grain so uh, as far as i can see in our particular area then we are going to need not necessarily more beekeepers but certainly more colonies of bees uh, for quite some time to come there will become a balance somewhere uh, but you know that's to be worked out as it happens in the future. Other areas might be different. London's a classical one where there aren't too many areas of allotments. There are a lot of public parks, but there are an awful lot of new beekeepers. And what the London uh, clubs are trying to do is to get people to do what we call community beekeeping, and that is uh, share the number of colonies. So there's no more colonies. There can be as many beekeepers as you want, but no more colonies of bees. Uh, yeah. Do this on a collective basis. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I think I've only got one more question because uh, I know you travel a lot and you uh, know about projects going on in other countries. Could you just ha highlight a couple that you think are sort of interesting at the moment? Uh, a fascinating one is uh, the introduction of honeybees to both Iceland and Greenland. Um, they're very different problem. In Iceland, they grow a lot of crops inside polytunnels. Um, so they are using bees to pollinate them. Um, these are all non-native crops to, to Iceland. These are uh, because they're hot springs that can grow bananas indoors. It's ridiculous. Um, but they use colonies of bees in these polytunnels and they have to move them between polytunnel as the crops um, uh, get fertilized and they move them on. The Greenland situation is a bit different and much more controversial. Um, because of global warming, 
the um, the permafrost is disappearing in southwest Greenland, so they can actually use the land for the first time. And they're thinking about growing crops, uh, but they'll need pollinators there. The downside to that is this soil has stored an awful lot of carbon for an awful lot of time, and the minute they start cultivating it, they're releasing the carbon. So that's a controversial uh, project. Other projects um, in the, the Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, um, they are looking very much into how they can raise more crops by, uh, they have a lot of pasture, they have a lot of um, forest. They're wanting to raise more crops without losing the value of the farmland. And again, they're looking to raise uh, the amount of pollinators they have in balance with uh, their pollination needs. Germany has a whole series of different problems. That's a, a big country and it depends whether you're in the north or the south. Yeah, interesting. Uh, in fact, there was a, I uh, mentioned, uh, well, perhaps I didn't, I was participating in an online conference a week or so ago, uh, organized by the Chinese and the Russians jointly, and that was keeping honeybees in very cold climates. Um, and that was quite interesting because they had very cold climates compared to ours, but they're very much warmer than they were 10 years ago. Uh, so now honeybees are a practicality, mainly the grey bee rather than the black bee, but uh, um, it's, it's interesting how it's developing. So there's a lot of interest worldwide in pollination. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's an uh, absolute serious uh, yes. matter, matter, isn't it? Yeah, so we've got to do what we can. Thanks very much, Fred. I thought that was brilliant. As everybody is happy with that, I will uh, turn the recording off now and draw this session to a close and uh, continue to enjoy the conference. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.